welcome everyone who's just coming in. We are gonna get started because it's now 807. That means Harvard time is up. Um, and I'm so glad that you all could join me for this talk, which is one that I planned, I was telling, um, telling my roommates over a year ago. I have really been interested in the White Mountains and in names for a long time. Um, and I'm really honored that you guys can join me as I'm about to graduate and to share in some of the learning that I've done um, in my years of exploring these mountains. They've meant an extraordinary amount to me. And I think as someone who shares the identities of an English teacher and a lover of the mountains, um, talking about where those names come from is really important to me. So I'm excited to share that with you. So a little bit of an overview of what we have tonight. I haven't done this whole talk, so I'm not sure how long it's gonna take, um, but we will cover a lot of ground. We're gonna start with just a little bit of context about what it means to um, have a place name and why that might be significant. And then we'll get into where the place names come from for actually all of the 48. And I promise it'll be quick and it won't be boring. Um, but if you leave this talk with something, I hope it'll be that some of these mountain names stick in your head and that you hold on to where they come from and that when we as the Harvard Outing Club take people outside, um, we can have an awareness of where those names are coming from and, and why they matter. Um, and then we'll hope to move past that a little bit to a little bit of discussion and some implications for Hawk um, and what it means for us to be aware of these words. And then I'll invite anyone who has other places to be on this fine Monday night to go, but then we'll play a game of Jeopardy to test what you guys have learned um, of the trivia and we'll see what's, what's stuck in your head. Um, so that's what I have in mind for tonight. And I just wanna start also by naming that I am by no means an expert on the place names of the White Mountains, on indigenous history, on everything that it means to have created these names and how they've shifted over time. But I'm an avid hobbyist and um, that's how I'm coming to things. So I, I'm really glad that you guys are joining me on this process and I hope that you'll understand where I'm at as sort of a, a level partner in having done a lot of research into this and always wanting to learn more. There's always more that we can learn. And I think that our role as outing club leaders is to try to learn ourselves so that we can share learning with others when we take people outside. Um, so I called this White Mountain Etymology. Etymology is the study of the origin of words, um, as Adam very well knows. And really more specifically, I might have called it a talk about toponymy, um, because that under the umbrella of the study of words is the study of place names. Um, and we and Hawk know very well CalTOPO, which is our favorite online mapping software and topography obviously refers to the study of, of place. Um, and that, yeah, that Greek prefix refers to the place. Um, but here we are, we're trying to figure out where these words um, have come from. So typically name place names, at least in the White Mountains and in a lot of national forests across um, America, um, have come into being in this way. They've, they're used locally um, by, in the case of many of the names that have lasted to the present day by white people who came to the land after it was already being used. Um, and so they have sort of predominated that way. They might be printed in books locally. And then in the case of the White Mountains, there's sort of an initial committee on nomenclature that, that has vetted the names and then the be all end all of place names in the United States since 1890 has been the US Board of Geographic um, names. And they are the ones who officially arbitrate whether or not a place um, has a given name to it. So um, I wanna invite us to think about why we're even here and why this is a topic that's worth discussing. So in the chat, if you could just think aloud for a little bit, what are some reasons that the name of a place matters. Why is it significant? Could be in the mountains, could be on the street, could be of a statue. <laughs> Thanks, James. Mm. Okay. 
keep reading these as they come in. I'm seeing a lot of history, ownership, identity, recognition. Thank you, Diana. Mm. Yeah, these are these are great ideas um, and want to encourage us to keep adding um, as we think about them. Um, yeah. And I want to keep us going with this train of thought and to think about why we might rename something. So if, if these are the reasons that names are important in the first place, what is an occasion when we should change a name? What motivates that? And you can feel free to be specific here um, if there are occasions that are coming to mind. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I'm seeing some patterns here as well. Michael, could I invite you to share more about what you meant by yours and you could read it aloud? Yeah, I'd said to reflect a new understanding of how the land is used. And I'm thinking you know, as places evolve, it might be necessary to rename them. Um, a place that may have been a really big thoroughfare, like a highway, maybe a small back road now, you might want to rename it um, a port may have changed from a significant port to be filled in, might want to change the name then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that idea of shifting understanding, right, can be a real motivator of why we might change a name. Um, and as Zoe and others have pointed out, in many cases that might be to remedy harm that was done in the past or to reflect new understandings of how colonial history has imposed itself and its names on land that it didn't have a right to impose itself upon. Um, so thank you all for sharing that. This is definitely the foundation of this talk and I hope something that we can all keep thinking about um, and we'll come back to it. So yeah, I wanna situate this naming renaming um, question in even a broader scope than just the outdoors. Um, on the top left, we have two headlines from the Crimson, um, both about renaming, both about Harvard's president. Um, in May 2019, there was a controversy about whether or not to rename the Sackler buildings, which you may know are sort of across the street from Canada um, and are loosely associated with the Sackler family, who was also um, sort of in part responsible for the, the opioid crisis. Um, and so there was a controversy about whether or not Harvard should have buildings that hold that name. Um, ultimately, those names have been kept in place, um, but you know, within, within the next two years, right now Harvard's undergoing this push and we just created a committee on renaming. A lot of the houses, including my own house, Lowell House are sort of embedded in internal reviews right now of what names to keep, what names to change. Um, and those conversations are ongoing. Um, one reason that people have typically advocated to change names of Harvard buildings is because of slave owning ties, um, which are very prevalent. I just, I didn't even know that DeWolf should have been on this list until my roommate Brinkley, who's here, told me today. Um, so there's sort of always more to learn about the ties of some of the people um, who made up Harvard in the past. Um, but there are lots of other, you know, troublesome histories associated with these people like homophobia and xenophobia for Lowell um, and anti-Semitism. So it's definitely an open question about whether or not, you know, we should hold on to these names. Um, I had someone in my Expos 40 class 
a year ago who said we should rename all buildings after 100 years were up. That was their argument. Um, and I think that's one way to go about things, but I, I do think it's worth considering. Just as another example, Yale renamed this college, um, formerly known as Calhoun College, um, for Grace Murray Hopper, who is an amazing computer pioneer and um, just a true force of nature. But um, I did think this New York Times headline was interesting because who is mentioned in the, the headline, right? Calhoun's name is the first word of this article and Grace Murray Hopper is not actually all mentioned in this title. So even the way that these types of things are packaged in journalism matters a lot. Um, and I think we have a long way to go, not only in place names, but in how we're talking about changing them. Um, so one really powerful example of renaming, we might say for the better or to dismantle colonial history is um, Denali in Alaska. Um, and this is a really extraordinary peak um, and has been named differently by up to nine different native groups and has lots of different um, translations, but generally referring to its size. Um, and it was three men who went to survey it in the early 20th century, um, who sort of came to the conclusion of Denali doesn't mean anything and we're gonna call it Mount McKinley so that it sticks. Um, and it did stick for uh, many decades. That's what both the park and the peak were known as. Um, and in 1975, the state of Alaska pushed back and said, no, we'd actually like to rename this to the indigenous name um, Ohio, um, where McKinley is from, led a successful effort to quell that for many years. Um, and it wasn't actually until 2015, so very recently that that name pivoted. Um, and so I think this is an example of you know, we might say it's a success story because now we know it as Denali, but I think the fact that this persisted for so long is definitely, um, you know, indicative of how many instances like this um, sort of still predominate. And so this really is not a resolved question. Um, some indigenous place names, both in the Northeast and around the world, have either made it to the present or been restored, but many, many have not. Um, and when you think about how long Native people were inhabiting the Americas um, relative to colonial people and, and sort of how that exchange happened, um, I think it's, it's just deeply upsetting that certain names um, continue to predominate over others. Um, and I wanna look specifically at New Hampshire um, these images on the right, the top one is a country club in Rye, New Hampshire, which is just part of New Hampshire's very small coastline. Um, it's a very wealthy and white part of New Hampshire. And this is the symbol and the name of the country club. Um, for those of us who drive to the whites, if you go um, to Lincoln Lafayette and sort of that gorge, you pass a brown and yellow sign for Indian Head Resort. Um, which is, of course, bears a, a racist symbol and a racist name. Um, there was a peak called Indian Head until very recently. Now it's renamed Mount Pemigewasset, but um, the resort still exists and is still profiting off of an image. It's not an indigenous owned um, resort. And so certainly am amounts to both cultural appropriation and um, you know, racist imagery that, that white people are still profiting off of after um, indigenous people were displaced in New Hampshire. Um, so I do think it's, you know, it, this is a very real and live thing, um, not just in terms of the mountains themselves. Um, so I wanna make a plug for a really valuable resource called Indigenous New Hampshire. I think both in terms of place names and in general, um, the stories that are told are told from a colonial perspective because that's the perspective that's been imposed on the world and on America. But um, this is a really awesome website that's come out of some New Hampshire universities and you can see what their mission is, right? Reframing New Hampshire's history from an indigenous perspective and it's full of really awesome um, resources and scholarship and maps. And I really encourage you to check it out. I've got a whole list of resources at the end of this talk. So we'll be sending that your way. But um, I do think it's, it's just worth understanding that at least with regards to place, the story that has been told is, is the colonial story. Um, and lastly, I want to just encourage 
us to think about how the names of places shape our understanding, even as we change them. Um, I have learned a lot of this in recent years. This was not part of my high school education, but um, even divisions like the need to sort native peoples into tribes um, were not necessarily reflective of how they saw themselves or, or the words that they used to describe themselves. Um, native peoples and colonial settlers tended to have categorical differences in terms of their relationship to the land and what it meant to be a person and did not necessarily um, root themselves in in a piece of land um, that they considered their own, but had a very different and reciprocal um, and expansive relationship with the land and with each other. Um, so that's sort of a point that, you know, even our in our efforts to use English to translate the, the names of various tribes, like that's not always reflective of um, what they referred to themselves by. Um, and finally, this last bullet is just a note about um, how literally translating indigenous words can have a negative um, effect if it's not sort of done intentionally and has certainly been used in the past to, you know, just sort of, ooh, and ah, this is what this native word means um, when really, you know, it, it's just, it's a whole language system and culture set that um, was systematically oppressed and um, was very valid and very different from how colonial settlers um, thought in a lot of ways. So I just want to say that I will be sharing some some best guess and some well-researched literal translations of various indigenous place names, but um, I think that's just important to keep in mind. Um, so the White Mountains themselves, the range, um, we're gonna start to dive into these place names. Um, it's sort of split, the White Mountains um, comes into use um, in colonial times and it's sort of split on whether it was called that because boats from the distance saw snow or they saw granite um, on the peaks. And so it's a little bit unclear for that reason, but um, one of those two tends to be the reason that the White Mountains is called what it's called. Now this is my very scientific um, copyrighted breakdown of the New Hampshire 48. There are 48 peaks over 4,000 feet in New Hampshire. And this is where their place names can generally be categorized. Um, does anyone notice anything about this breakdown? Want to share any thoughts? Feel free to unmute, feel free to throw it in the chat. What are we noticing about this spread? Thank you, Adam, a lot of white dudes. Yes, pretty much. Um, yeah, and the, obviously the president's category also refers to white dudes because we do not yet have a Mount Obama. So if you actually add those up, 24 of the 48, exactly, so exactly half are um, named after white dudes, um, which we'll get into. So I'm gonna go through all of these. We're not gonna spend all the time on all of them, but um, buckle up for the ride because this is how you're gonna know where all the mountain names came from. Um, all of the presidentials were named, except for Washington, were named pretty much in a day um, by a group of people who went up and surveyed them, including John W. Weeks, after whom Weeks Bridge is also named. Um, Mount Adams, is one of several peaks named after um, the Adams family. Um, so that's where that comes from. The presidentials are generally divided from um, highest to lowest, and then they go through the, um, the presidents, the first couple presidents um, in that order. Um, Eisenhower was originally Pleasant Mountain. And then this chief of staff, Sherman the Iceberg Adams, um, sort of advocated to get it changed and did so successfully. So talk about a good wingman, point man, um, get your name on a mountain because Eisenhower was not part of this early cohort of presidents. Um, these, it's the same story. Um, these are all, you know, named after the presidents um, who are assigned to them. Um, Mount Pierce 
was originally Mount Clinton um, to honor uh, DeWitt Clinton, a New York Senator, shout out anyone from New York, um, who led the establishment, yes, Diana, who led the establishment of the Erie Canal, not the, not the Suez, none of this evergreen nonsense, but um, yeah, was also a really significant lawmaker. Um, but it's kind of cool that the New Hampshire legislature changed it because Franklin Pierce is the only president that has ever been elected from New Hampshire. So a little bit of fun recognition there. Um, and finally, Mount Washington, um, which is the tallest, tallest in the whites. Um, Nathan knows how tall that is, 6288, baby. Um, and yeah, I, I think that the, the native name Agio Kochuk um, is beautiful. And um, this mountain definitely has a, an interesting relationship in terms of how it was climbed. Um, the indigenous people who lived in the area revered it um, and didn't climb it. Um, so actually the first known people or the first known person to climb it um, was this guy named uh, Darby Field, who um, it took him 18 days to climb it. Um, with the help of two indigenous guides. Um, and he was pretty astounded by it. Um, when it was named after Washington, he wasn't president. There was sort of Washington mania. He was a really popular general and everyone was naming things left and right after him. Um, so he was not a president when he got this particular um, title, but um, definitely an impressive mountain with a lot of history. Um, and that, takes us through the prezies. Um, pretty rapid fire there because we don't need to give them all the airtime. They've already been president of the United States. Um, but I wanna pause there. Any questions, any wonderings? Pretty straightforward. Yeah. All right, we'll keep going. Um, next up we have white dudes of renown, which again is the largest category and I'm aware of what it means to start with all that, but we're gonna get through this so that we can keep going um, into the indigenous history as well. Um, so this guy, George Bond, pretty cool guy, Harvard guy. You're gonna see a lot of Harvard affiliations here, um, which is another thing we can talk about. Um, but he was really a pioneer when it came to space and documentation of that. So um, yeah, he took the first ever photograph of a star, which is pretty cool. Um, he did a lot of work on Earth. He surveyed the White Mountains pretty closely. Um, he discovered a moon on Saturn and um, has not only the White Mountains named after him, but also some craters on the moon and on Mars. So he is definitely up there as one of those people who um, maybe has even more interesting places named after him than the Whites, um, but very cool and um, accomplished a lot in his 40 years of life. Um, Sebastian Cabot is quite an old throwback um, of these guys. He was an Italian explorer who you might have learned about in high school, um, who sought um, passage through the through the Northwest um, and did quite a bit of exploring of various coasts and um, also was a pioneer of hipster beards. Didn't get very far, but um, interesting guy. Um, Kerrigan, this is, um, I think it's very cool that this mountain is, it's very geographically central in the whites because this guy was really the premier cartographer of the white mountains. The Kerrigan map is a really famous and really the first pretty accurate map of the whites that was created. Um, and he was a New Hampshire um, boy through and through. He went to Dartmouth, ran a general store, sort of a jack of all trades. Um, and then was New Hampshire Secretary of State. I'm gonna go ahead and guess that those years are wrong, um, but maybe he had a one-year tenure, I don't know. Um, but yeah, very cool, um, accurate, advanced cartography, which was a really developing field at this time. Um, field, we talked about a little bit. Um, this is the guy who first climbed Mount Washington. And so he's actually got his own peak named after him. Um, and was a pretty humble guy who's he just ran a ferry in Boston, um, but got up north and said, hey, I want to climb that thing. Um, so definitely interesting. He has certainly kept his legacy alive um, through that one act and 
there are lots of little things named field in New Hampshire as well. Um, Hale, Hale is a pretty cool guy. Um, this is not a peak that gets a lot of love, but um, he's a child prodigy who graduated from BLS at age 13. Um, so Nathan's a little behind. Um, but yeah, he was a super advanced scholar and took on, again, more roles at Harvard, um, wrote a really famous short story and was related to the famous Revolutionary War spy. So really, I mean, this guy was just living his best life and um, yeah, also, also has a peak to commemorate his name. Um, now we've got the Hancocks. Um, John Hancock is the known for his giant, giant, giant signature on the Declaration of Independence. There's a joke that he wanted it to be seen by King George from England um, and was also governor of Massachusetts, pretty pivotal person in the revolution. Um, but yeah, it has two peaks, two peaks to his name. Um, this one you might think should belong in the presidentials. No, big misconception about the whites. Um, Charles Thomas Jackson was a state geologist of New Hampshire, very illustrious role. Um, and he actually did a lot. He was very, very involved in the White Mountains and in surveying them and all of that. So um, I'm very glad that it is to commemorate him and not Andrew Jackson. Um, and someone's got to get on the $20 bill, but that's another discussion. Um, yeah, also brother-in-law of Ralph Waldo Emerson. So interesting there. Um, all right, the Kinsmans. I think, Jack, you said you were, you were here for the Kinsmans. Um, so yeah, I've got Nathan Kinsman. Not much is known about him. He was um, the first colonial settler of Eastern New Hampshire and he ran a militia. Um, so I hope he had a good life. Um, and I don't quite know who, which strings he pulled to get himself two peaks named after him. Um, but yeah, not much of a story there. Now I've got Lafayette, um, continuing with the not quite, uh, presidentials, but in that circle, there's also a Franklin mountain, but, um, it's not prominent. So it's not a 4,000 footer. Um, and we all know a little bit about Mr. Lafayette, but that is, um, next to Lincoln, um, on that, on Frank Ridge. Got Tom. Now there's a huge um, proliferation of tourism in the whites in the 19th century. There was, you know, the cars were being invented and travel was becoming what it was. And so you had sort of these various inns and things get established in the White Mountains. Um, and Tom Crawford was really the person who drove that. The Crawford family is was the hub uh, and the, the family that was at the heart of that. Today, the AMC Highland Center, which is the biggest AMC center is at Crawford Notch, um, which is named after them. Crawford Path is the oldest continually used hiking trail in the US. Um, and yeah, definitely very prominent family. Um, you would really be amazed at what people wore when they went on these excursions. It like, full petticoats for the women, full suits for the men. They were not making things easy for themselves and they were definitely carrying more weight on their backs collectively than, than any of us were. I think something like the average woman today wears about a yard of clothing at a time. And these women were wearing 40 yards and hiking the whites. So pretty baller, but also what were you doing anyway? Um, this is a bit of a tragedy, the Willie family. Um, they were another family who ran an inn in the Whites. And after a drought, there was an awful flood followed by a landslide. And to try to escape the, the landslide, the family evacuated their house. Um, but actually, tragically and ironically, the house was the only parcel of land that was left untouched by the landslide. So they all that perished in the actual landslide, but the house sort of stood there. Um, and yeah, interestingly enough, that story proved so compelling that it got all over the place and actually drove a lot of tourism to the white. So their deaths um, even helped the industry after they had passed, but um, that's pretty much that. So that was 24 Peaks. How are we doing? We have whiplash. 
We, we still invested, can I get a thumbs up, thumbs down? How's everyone doing? Learning? Um, yeah, take these names in. This is all the ground that we've covered so far. I think it's interesting to see it spelled out. Um, and, you know, this is, this is the halfway mark. And again, these are all white dudes. Um, and I think it's just worth understanding um, what it means that so many of the white mountains are labeled this way. I wasn't on this trip, but had um, at a leader meeting debrief once, um, someone said that they had encountered on the trail, someone who said, oh, you know, like, I, I think a leader said, I wish I could name a mountain after myself or something sort of offhand. And then someone on the trail responded, um, oh, you know, they're all just named after Harvard dudes. Um, which obviously the person didn't know that this person was also a Harvard dude. And so it's just, you know, it's worth thinking about um, when we're on the trail. And to tie it back to slave, to slave owners, for example, all these bolded names um, in some way were associated with slave owning. So it's definitely, I think, just interesting to consider what it means um, that we platform these people in the way that we do, especially given, you know, all of the reflections that you guys had about you know, why do we name something something or why do we name something and change a name of a place if we realize it's no longer worth venerating. A lot of these names and presidents on the left, for example, are in various school districts, for example, being renamed and um, definitely an active question and one that I think is worth thinking about. Um, yeah come back to have space to discuss that later, but um, I hope you guys will just sit with that. Um, so now we're back in the land of the bubbles. Um, and I'm really excited for the second half because um, I think you can think about, you know, what, what, how do we want to represent um, a name, a place? I want to read this quote um, from Thoreau and I would love a volunteer to do it if someone is feeling like it. Um, if you would like to read this quote aloud for me, could you throw an asterisk in the chat? Don't be shy. Thank you, Ray. I'm pretty sure the literature of mountains is what everyone thinks I study, even though it's not. But I do like the literature of mountains as a hobby. Oh no, did we, did I go back one? Hmm. All right, hold up. We good, we back? Okay, I will read this one and then I would like um, a volunteer to read the next slide. So, Flint's Pond, such is the poverty of our nomenclature. What right had the unclean and stupid farmer whose farm abutted on this sky water, whose shores he had ruthlessly laid bare to give his name to it. Rather let it be named from the fishes that swim in it, the wild flower, fowl or quadrupeds which frequent it, the wild flowers which grow by its shores, or some wild man or child, the thread of whose history is interwoven with its own. So I remember reading this in Walden and um, being compelled by it and thinking, yeah, true, you know, why, why do certain places have these names and what would it mean to change them so that they more closely reflected the people who called it home? Um, and I think it's interesting to think of that in the context of, you know, Thoreau himself was a white guy who had somewhat problematic, um, although not totally uncompassionate relationships with the native people. Um, so I do think it's worth thinking about. And one way that we think about it is um, by doing land acknowledgements, which have grown a lot in prevalence over um, recent years, um, and I think are important to consider. They can be very performative, is I think one big reason that people push back on them are, you know, you're just sort of gonna, it's almost like you check the box and you say it, and then you go about your day and you haven't actually reckoned with the history of a place, 
um, or it's used sort of cavalierly. Um, but one of the most helpful ways that I have heard land acknowledgements discussed is um, that it, it prompts self-reflection and it prompts awareness. And um, I do think that those things are important. And if you are sharing a land acknowledgement with good reason, um, and you're seeing yourself as an active part of that, um, I think that there, there is merit to that. So this is one um, that I pulled from Indigenous New Hampshire. Um, and I actually won't ask someone to read it because I'm gonna go to the next slide. But um, this is an example of what a land acknowledgement might look like. Um, and I pause there because I think sometimes people who are not familiar with native words sort of, or, or words that are just unfamiliar to them in general, sort of bulk and don't want to take a stab at pronouncing them or they see letters that are appearing in an order that doesn't, that doesn't make sense to them or isn't familiar to them. And so they just, you know, they don't even try um, or things like that. So um, yeah, I wanna encourage us to not let that be a barrier and to seek out pronunciation resources and things that can help us um, pronounce native words and, and to try to you know do that and do it justice. Um, so these are the two words that were, appeared in the previous slide. Um, Ndakina is the first one and Amabak is the second. Um, and yeah, I wanna invite everyone to unmute with me and practice saying Ndakina. Okay, I'm gonna see some mute signs hopping off and then we're gonna count down from three and we're gonna say it. All right, ready? Three, two, one. Ndakina. Ndakina. Yeah, good stuff. Um, you could feel free to remute and then keep saying that if you want or not. But um, yeah, this is something that I'm continually learning more about, but um, I like I think it's important to get right and to make every attempt to get right. So encourage all of us to do that. Um, and with that, going to move into the indigenous history chapter of the White Mountains place names. Um, so we're going back in time a little bit. You guys remember this Washington slide. Um, and we might think of this case as one almost inverse to Denali, right? Where the indigenous name um, has not made a, a resurgence, even though it is still more present than a lot of other indigenous names that have been wiped off of other related mountains. I think the fact that it's Mount Washington, um, you know, has significance that um, almost like Denali, right, which is sort of a peak with an equal amount of clout, um, has sort of not been kept or kept. Um, Moose Lock is an Abenaki word for bald place um, that was sort of bungled around and, and translated in different ways. Um, and it's the first mountain that you hit in the whites coming north if you're on the Appalachian Trail. Um, also an ongoing joke in Hawk um, that there are no views on Moose Lock. But the photo on the right is from a beautiful trip that Matt Kung took up there last winter. Um, we've got Pasa Conway, which is an Anglicanized version of Papisa Kanewa, um, which loosely translates as son of the bear. Um, and this person was really held up as, as essentially a, a half deity. He's a really powerful chief um, who united many, many tribes, um, sort of in a way that no one had really done before and was said to possess all kinds of incredible powers like making water burn and being invisible and reviving snakes from the dead. And um, really there was sort of nothing that he couldn't do, um, but is best known for his unity of many different disparate um, tribes. Um, and is also reflected in the Kankamagas Highway, which is named after his grandson. Um, so definitely a, a towering figure. Um, Wombeck, I think, puts forth an, a good example that there's often no one word that was used to describe these places, no one translation. Again, there were many different words that were used um, that were descriptive. 
And so these are just some various translations of what Wombeck, um, the one that survives, might have mean meant. And um, it's abounded by Star King, which is um, named for a Unitarian minister and a colonial settler. So those two peaks are sort of right next to each other, even though this guy Star King was a big proponent of white tourism to the region and um, almost you know, helped erase the, the culture of the place name that it shares a range with. Um, very interestingly, the people who were naming the White Mountains uh, chose in some cases to name indigenous or to use indigenous names that had nothing to do with New Hampshire. And so at the same time that they were sort of wiping out indigenous people and changing existing indigenous place names. They also then sort of weirdly commodified and idolized indigenous people who lived in entirely different parts of the country and then prescribed those names onto the peaks. So definitely messy. Um, Osceola was a Florida um, chief and was born in Alabama, but a really one of the most famous um, Native American leaders that exists. Um, led for over a year a really successful resistance and sort of rejected the U.S. government's attempt to force the Seminole people off their land in Florida. Um, and unfortunately, and in a way that's reflective of a lot of the ways that the U.S. government treated indigenous people, the only way that he was ultimately captured was under a false white flag um, that was put forward and, and he was captured and mistreated in jail and then eventually died um, in jail soon after, um, but had nothing to do with New Hampshire, was just a very famous um, indigenous leader and then was um, commemorated in this way. Very tragic end to his, his leadership in his life. Um, similarly, Tecumseh, um, which is actually the only 4,000 footer that's not a 4,000 footer, it is 39, 97 feet, but um, someone miscalculated originally and they're not about to change it because 48 is a pretty number. Um, but Tecumseh was um, based in modern Indiana, essentially, and um, was one half of a really powerful duo of brothers. Um, Tecumseh was sort of the political brain and his brother was the religious uh, figure. And the two of them founded a town that was called Prophetstown. His brother was no, known as the prophet and um, Tecumseh was sort of the enforcer, again, the political leader. And they created this amazing, again, intertribal, expansive community um, that did a lot to resist the US government and work with the British to resist the US, US government. Um, but when he died in 1813, um, that whole, it was almost, I mean, in some ways like a cult, like just so built around this one leader and this one amazing and dynamic figure that um, the Confederacy that he had created crumbled pretty immediately. Um, and a lot of uh, the harm that was done to native peoples in terms of the government taking their land and um, just sort of the collapse of the unity that had existed directly followed his death. Um, so another really important figure with a similarly tragic end um, as, ha as happened very much too often. Um, that, takes us, that takes us through the um, indigenous place names that are assigned to the 48. And I just, I definitely feel the number of those names and those, that set of stories as very different from the first two chapters that we went through. Um, and I think that, yeah, there, there's a lot there, frankly. Um, these ones are a bit more lighter hearted or simple. Um, Flume was discovered by this 93 year old badass named Aunt Jess Guernsey. Imagine you're a 93 year old woman and you're out for your stroll and then you see this giant torrent of water pouring through a crack in the mountains um, and you discover a mountain <laughs> um, and a, this really famous waterfall. This place is mob. This is like one of New Hampshire's big tourist things, a little boardwalk that goes out to this beautiful gorge. Um, but yeah, pretty cool discovery. 
Um, Gale Head, not much to it. It's above the Gale River, looks down on it. Um, these two are named for similar reasons. Isolation is truly in the middle of nowhere. It's very not near any of the other peaks. Um, and Owl's Head is, pokes up like a little sprout or a, an owl's head um, in the middle of the Pemigewasset Bowl, which is mostly a, a big bowl of mountains on all sides. Um, so, you know, owls are known for heads that can, you know, revolve almost all the way around. So that's sort of where that comes from. Um, Cannon's pretty interesting. Um, I know we have at least one person who's from New Hampshire, um, and this mountain has undergone quite a few name changes. Before 1917, I have no idea who Frank was, couldn't find the answer, but it was called Frank Mountain. And then someone looked at it from this angle that you see on the bottom right and saw what's clearly, you know, looks like a profile shape of a person, right? And so that was named Profile Mountain to reflect that. And this symbol became, you know, really the be all end all of New Hampshire. It's still on road signs everywhere. Um, and then very sadly collapsed in May 2003, which was devastating to um, some New Hampshire tourist industry people and some people who thought it was really cool. Um, so you can see the right half of this image is um, what it looks like now. So it no longer has that profile, but the image is still really strong and it's known as the old man in the mountain. Um, and I want to make a plug for Brinkley's dad who um, works in the filmmaking industry and just sent me, I haven't seen it yet, but maybe we can watch as a hawk showing the authoritative documentary on um, the old man in the mountain. So very cool stuff. I hope we can watch it sometime. Um, and yeah, this is just an interesting quote that I also like um, more English. Men hang out their signs indicative of their respective trades. Shoemakers hang out a gigantic shoe, jewelers a monster watch, and the dentist hangs out a gold tooth. But in the mountains of New Hampshire, God Almighty has hung out a sign to show that there he makes men, um, which I think is a cool image. You guys have all seen those big like shoe. I think there's one outside of the shoe repair guy in Cambridge. Anyway, vivid and now lost, but still very present in New Hampshire's memory. Next up, these are baseline geography. We've got the tri pyramids. Bingo, there are three of them, but um, only two of them are 4,000 feet because the others are not prominent. And then we have the twins, which there are two of them, hence the twins. Um, Whiteface is contributing to the side of the White Mountains debate that says the white is for granite. Uh, it's just got a lot of exposed rock. And um, Zealand, interestingly enough, was originally known as New Zealand Valley because it was also remote. And so they thought, what, what could be more remote than New Zealand? Um, and it was eventually just shortened to Zealand for um, the convenience of the railroad that um, briefly went through it. So we're getting to the end. You guys have been swell. Um, these are, this is the mixed bag. This is, I hope you're surprised by some of this stuff. Um, okay, the Carters. Um, this one is really not authoritative, but legend has it that there were two hunting buddies who went out for a rip and they got separated and they decided to climb adjacent peaks to find each other. And the peak that Carter climbed is now known as Carter Dome. Um, and the peak that Height climbed, um, this is a little bit tricky. The peak that Height climbed was named Wild, was named Height. But that peak that he allegedly climbed um, is now Wildcat A. And now there's a sub peak of Carter Dome that is named Mount Height. Um, so kind of tough, equal hiking buddies. One of them is much more well-known than the other, but um, yeah, sort of interesting. Um, Liberty was originally called one of the haystacks along with the rest of them on that ridge. And there's still little haystack and other elements of that that persist because they sort of look like stacks all next to each other. But New Hampshire is a state of live free or die. So someone got rid of that and now it's Liberty. Um, Mariah is named after the biblical Mariah um, in, on which Abraham offers his son up to God. Um, so I'm not sure again who named that, but that is what it's named for. And um, it's interesting to think about a mountain 
in New Hampshire holding that name. Um, okay. Wildcats A and D. Um, these I think were just a whim, but given by this guy, Arnold Gio, who was another one of the people who did a ton to survey and label the White Mountains, excuse me, and has a campsite named after him. Um, so definitely a present guy in the history of the Whites. And the observant ones among you will notice that we are at 48. Um, so that's, you know, we've, we've traversed all of these peaks in this hour. And um, we'll let you just take in for a second the names of all the ones here, knowing that we have Jeopardy coming up for those of you who are going to stick around. Um, and yeah, sort of compare these names and what we're looking at here to the first half of things. Um, I think, you know, I'm very lucky to have memories associated with a lot of a lot of these peaks. And um, I think that the names of these places um, really are significant and yeah, special. Um, just for kicks, just because we don't discriminate against things that are not the 48, I'm going to take you through a couple of other very popular hawk sites. Um, and I really hope that some of this has stuck with you. I will make these slides available, but we can talk about these things on our trip. I think it's cool to situate your participants um, and shout out participants who are here um, in you know, this, this sort of history and this awareness. So Mananak, I know Ray just left, but um, Mananak loosely translates to Bear Smooth Mountain. This was from a trip I led last October. You can see on the left um, that it is a very smooth mountain at the top. And you can see on the right, the face of a West Coast girl who has discovered fall foliage for the first time. Um, yeah, very, very joyful there. Um, flip side, Kearsarge is um, Abenaki for rough mountain or pointed mountain, or, cause again, there's no authority on this and different sets of people had different names for these places. It might also be Algonquin for born of the hill that first shakes hands with the dawn, um, which I think is beautiful. And you can see Morgan and Rob here on the left. This is from RTT and this photo on the right is not dawn, but sunset, but um, I think lovely as well. Um, Chikorua is, um, a special peak to me, I, I live this fall in the shadow of it. And this legend is apparently entirely made up, um, but is the reason that this this mountain is named what it's here for. And Michael, are you there? I know you said Chikara was your favorite. So I wanna invite you to, to read this um, legend on the right, if you can see it. Um, I can sort of read it. It says, in several versions, the legend sequence relates the mysterious death of Chikorwa's son while in the care of a settler named Campbell. Suspicious of the cause, the Pekawit chieftain took revenge on the settler's family. Then in retaliation, Campbell killed Chikorwa on the peak of the mountain, now bearing the Indian's name. What I've also heard is that um, the chieftain went to the top and set fire to the mountain to prevent them from reaching him. And they never actually did, and he just disappeared in the fire. That's why Chikorwa, which has no right to have a bare peak because it's so much lower, actually has one. Wow, fascinating. I have also heard that it's bare because of a set of forest fires in the early 20th century, but we may never know. Um, but yeah, the story with this is that um, theoretically his son Twamba stumbled across some arsenic that was used for poisoning foxes who were attacking the chickens, ingested it, died, and then um, the Chief Chikorwa killed this, this guy Campbell's family in retaliation, and then they had a climactic showdown on top of the peak um, that ended with them both dead. Um, but no one's even sure that he existed, so it's very odd. Um, Pemigwasset is Oh, I'm sad um, that Jack just left because um, he is the one who pointed out to me that you cross the Pemi five times on the way to the whites. You just keep crossing it, crossing it, crossing it on 93 if you drive up it. Um, but is Abenaki for the river having its course through here? And this photo is um, for the middle of the Pemi wilderness. Oh no. Um, anyway, looking at Owl's Head, it's a really beautiful river. Um, and then finally, I think this is almost finally, one more after this. Um, 
Wewanin Pisaki um, has been Anglicanized as Winnipesaukee, and that's this massive lake in New Hampshire. We usually climb Mount Major that overlooks it, um, beautiful and pretty easy hike. Um, and here I've sort of deconstructed the word to show you how the component part that it's made up of. So you have Wewini meaning around, Nebes meaning lakes or ponds, and Aki meaning region or territory. And so that comes together to mean at the lake nearby, which there are other lakes. Um, and there's a really cool 16 minute documentary about the indigenous history of the lake produced by Indigenous New Hampshire that I um, encourage you to watch if you're interested in it. Um, and finally, this one's just funny. Um, there is a mountain in New Hampshire that is called Go Back Mountain. And it is theoretically called that because that is what people did when they came upon it, these austere cliffs. And they just said, nope, that'll be all. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I think these are, it's pretty fascinating stuff, um, and has meant a lot to me. So, um, yeah, I really want to thank you guys for, oh no, um, for tuning in. And if you have to go all good, um, let me go back one sec. Um, but yeah, basically I just want to know what, what questions you're left with and, um, knowing that we're here in the context of Hawk, like what does all this mean for Hawk? And you saw on my next slide a little bit, some of what board has been thinking about and what I have been thinking about, but um, would love either in the chat or if you wanna unmute, just sort of what you're thinking about and um, what you think this might mean for Hawk. Or you can just applaud me, either, either or. Does anyone have questions about anything specific or not? Thanks, Kate. Not on topic, but what about Katahdin? Mm. Um, Katahdin is, the way that it's spelled now is an Anglicanized version of the original word, which I'm pretty sure is spelled like that. Um, I do forget what it means, but it does it does have meaning in the indigenous language. Um, yeah, there's a really beautiful Thoreau piece about Katahdin that I will send if anyone's interested. But again, um, interesting that it's split. You know, that that his writing is what's persisted about the place when he didn't really have a claim to it. Um, so just in the interest of um, sort of sharing, sharing what Hawk has been thinking about, um, we want to um, just share with you again. This is what the administrative mute function was created for. I, hello, Kay, whoever you are, but um, okay. What this means for Hawk, we have a pre-trip form that is essentially our vehicle for safety. It has the, the address and where people are going and things like that. Um, we are adding a question for future trips that go out about the traditional stewards of the land. Um, and our hope is that leaders can have an awareness of who inhabited the land that is making up the body of their trips. Um, definitely something that, again, like all of this needs to be approached the right way. and. Um, needs to be consistent and and sort of thoughtful, and I won't be here for that. But um, yeah, I think you know having it be present in discussion on the trail and in the pre-trip meeting, there are lots of natural avenues for it to come up, and I hope that it comes up and is something that people build awareness of. Um, FOP is very luckily um, has the funds to run decolonization training for their leaders next week. Um, it's something I wish we could offer to Hawk, but it's very expensive. Um, but I'm really excited that the two orgs coexist and can learn from each other. And so we're excited to follow up with them after that. Um, the Harvard Votes Challenge is propo a proponent of a day of civic action on April 29th, which is um, supposed to be sort of a reuniting of organizational civic action. Um, and so the idea is that various clubs on that day just do something that's civically oriented, whether it's having a discussion or advocating for something. Hawk hasn't decided what we're doing, but 
Um, I think we definitely could do something in terms of, you know, writing to senators about why Indian head resort still exists or somehow considering what we've talked about today. So putting that on people's radar. And then um, there is a really awesome group called Summits in Solidarity that is um, New Hampshire based and is about sort of dismantling exactly how white the white mountains of New Hampshire have been. And so they have a, a sort of open hike on June 26, where um, sort of similarly to the 9-11 tradition on which um, people hike up all the 48 on 9-11 with American flags, that we just get a lot of people out in the whites with explicit you know, advocacy and signs um, on behalf of um, more diversity in the, in the whites. Um, and also, you know, I think it's significant that I have talked a lot about indigenous history um, on this call, but Hawk doesn't really have a relationship with Harvard Natives as an organization. Um, and I think that's something that we should think about. I'm not, you know, haven't fully fleshed out what that means, but I hope that future iterations of Hawk will keep that in mind. I think we have a long way to go as a club, um, but I think we've taken some really important steps this year to bring greater awareness to the history um, and the people of the land that, that we normally send trips out on. Um, so that's pretty much that. Um, I will be sending out all of these resources, but these are some of the ones that have been foundational to this talk. Um, and I'd really like to thank you all for coming.